uh, thank you for the t uh, for the talk. Um, just got a question about uh, the generally the, the Muslims now, the, the the Indian Muslims identity. I mean, I came across few of my friends years ago um, who were Indian Muslims, and uh, when I was talking with them, most of them they, they seems to have um, they're very proud of their Indian identity. They look down at Pakistan. They look up that they are. Look at them; they're different. I'll, I'll, sometimes I'll, they, are, they are Muslims yeah, like you, and they are Sunnis as well. And they are just, you know, they, they are just. We are Indian. We are superior. We're different. How do you see now with the rise of um, um, this leader? Um, how how do you see the, the the religious identity? What do you think the Muslims will shift back to? Look at their religious identity, or they still their patriotic Indian. Identity. Now, th thanks. I mean, I mean, remember, we are talking of a uh, community that's huge in size, right? 14% of Indian population implies 160 million plus, right? So we can never generalize about them. That's number one. Number two, you're right. I mean, until, and this is where there's a fun, there have always been problems of religious nationalism, you know, and Islamophobia, or any kind of thing. No, all societies have problems. But what's fundamentally different about Modi and BJP and the Hindu nationalism since 2014 is that while other parties can be opportunistically communal, sometimes mostly pro-Hindu, but sometimes anti-Hindu also depending on what uh, benefits them, BJP is resolutely communal, right? That's a difference. So what of course happens is until 2014, Indians would be good at saying that, look at India, you have got a president who's Muslim and a prime minister who's Sikh and the most powerful politician is Roman Catholic, Sonia Gandhi and his Hindu majority, so we are good democracy, right? So that was the image of India. But with Modi, all of that is gone. The image of India is very clearly now rapidly descending into what I would say, in fact, I've argued, or po it's a rhetorical point, but I think it's a valid <coughs> point is, if Pakistan or ISI had an agent in India to destroy idea of India, that would be Narendra Modi. The reason is because the very idea of India, the secular country is being destroyed. So in a way, Modi and BJP and RSS, they are fulfilling the fear that Jinnah and others had that they will be permanent minority in India. So in a way, that's what they're pushing towards. This is why you, if you take example of the language they use, RSS language is not different from Jamaat Islami's language there. They both have language of we are the peaceful one, we are the superior ones, everyone else is inferior to us, right? So that's the kind of language they use. Now, of course, the challenge Indian Muslims face, apart from the fact that they're not united, is how to survive. It's about livelihood. So there are different kinds of movements. There are leaders like OVC who are in area that's Muslim majority and they're very vocal. But they're also very clear they're not with Kashmir. They are very pro-India. So India, that they cannot challenge. The moment you challenge the idea of India in any way, then you're anyway seen as enemy, right? That's not there. So my own, uh, from distance, right, uh, based on what you see, read and everything is, there's a lot of rethinking amongst Muslims themselves in India, including intellectuals, which direction to go to. And there are multiple directions. One thing they realize is that secular parties, the left parties have failed them. So one po possibility, and that's what a number of my Muslim friends are also saying, that there's a growing move towards religion and move away from politics, but not religious politics, move away from politics, keep quiet, no need to vote, just focus on your livelihood, and survive, right? That's a kind of move. But uh, we also have to bear in mind it's a large scale population. I mean, it's not a small population. And the fact of the matter is BJP has not delivered economically in a central level. Gujarat was an exception, but even not an exception. Frankly, even there's a lot of myth making there. There's, uh, they're not delivered. So let's see what happens in five years time. In five years time, I mean, this year they could sell statues and everything, but they sold Pakistan. Let's see what they sell in five years time. The reality of the matter is, majority of Hindus even now have not voted for BJP. It's just that they have voted for so many parties, different parties, that they're divided. What's unique about BJP is they've consolidated votes. So they're still getting 40, 45% of vote, not more than 50% of vote. No, it's, yeah, okay. Even in the 1960s, when we were in um, Uganda as uh, school, uh, you know, going to uh, primary schools and secondary schools, our Hindu friends were even at that time being recruited into RSS, and they used to go to this shaksha and uh, 
is you know short khaki shorts and sticks and all that. So it's a long-standing indoctrination in one of the diaspora communities. I'm sure it's happening here as well. And I, I don't know if you know that some time ago, I think it's 20 years now, Tariq Ali wrote an article that most of the Hindus will fund BJP or, or the RSS types here. And therefore now, as you say, there's going to be a meeting of minds between the Islamophobia right and the Hindus here, uh, which is happening. So that's just an observation. Maybe it's worth doing some research on some of these diaspora here, what is their experience of RSS and so on. But the question I have is that, uh, two questions actually. One is I was quite surprised by the result in UP. Because obviously, as you know, the composition of UP between Muslims and uh, the OBCs and the Dalits and things can easily get rid of the Hindu majority there, but they didn't. And what about the South? Are you saying that the South is so divided that it couldn't make any difference? Okay. Thank you with the South. Of course, even now, if you look at Indian election, if there's a saffronization of India, it excludes Tamil Nadu and uh, Kerala, right? Even Andhra. So, despite all the efforts, BJP is still not a pan-Indian party, right? That's number one. That doesn't mean that it cannot be. Until 20 years ago, people imagine it could not go south of India. Now it has gone to Karnataka. So that's the thing. We have to bear in mind, for instance, in uh, Nagpur, what I noticed was uh, RSS and uh, even the Sevika Samiti, which they had, they had a lot of students from northeast, northeast of India, right? And they were putting effort, very politely teaching them. You see, the subtle indoctrination has, was going on in regions because they feared that northeast will become Christian. So, and Kerala would become Christian or Muslim. So they have been doing that socially. That is it. We have to understand RSS and Hindu nationalism not only as a political phenomenon, but actually a socio-cultural phenomenon, right? Now, in terms of UP election, a lot of people had expected that with the uh, two political parties, SP, BSP, working together, they should win election more easily. They did not. Now, of course, there is whole uh, debate about why it did not happen, we still don't know what, why it did not happen. They did win some seats, but it seems that while leaders were working with each other, the voters were not. And for that reason, to understand that, let's take example of the UK. Uh, the working class population that's non-white, the immediate oppressor might not be a white aristocrat. There might be people in between. What I mean is, the Dalits, who would be the former untouchables, right? Dalits are the oppressed one. They're the most oppressed people, 15% of population. The direct oppression of Dalit is by not only the upper caste, which are small, but by the middle castes. So a lot of tension in India is between the Dalits and the ones above them. Divide and rule. That's how caste system functions. So B BSP reflects the broadly the, low, uh, the Dalits. The Samajwadi party reflects other backward classes, the one in between. So while political party could come together, socially in the village, you have tension between the castes, right? That's how it happened. But of course, the upper caste at this point in time remain united because they believe that here is one Hindu, you know, one Hrida Samarata, whatever they call him, right? He's a love, I think there was this crush on Modi, right? So they have got this order that we have to be united. That's how they function. Second, of course, there's a whole story about EVMs malfunctioning, a lot of corruption, and to an extent that we would not know whether it's true or not. But the reality is bureaucracy, like media, is, has turned quite saffronized. It has become saffronized. So those things also could have played a role. In terms of uh, diaspora and RSS, you're right, remember, RSS has been there since the 1920s. It's not a new phenomenon. What's new, of course, is the political respectability it has. So while in 1960s and 70s, in, you may find in Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, in majority part of India, they were not that powerful because, of course, until the Nehruvian idea was strong. But by now, they are the mainstream. So you have uh, RSS, which is the uh, also on Doordarshan, which is the national television. You have the ministers going and reporting to RSS. Before 2014, uh, you found something, I found something interesting, Indian media saying how Modi is standing up against RSS, right? So Modi is a modernizer, development, development messiah, he'll bring development, right? And Gujarat, yes, what happened was wrong, but let's forget, move on. 
So you had Lord Meghna Desai, one of the uh, broadly centrist liberal intellectuals here, also started saying, I remember, uh, you know, yes, Gujarat was not right, 2002, but we can't keep talking of Gujarat. Let's move on. Focus on Modi as a development person. The reality is, Modi is RSS. He has never denounced RSS. He cannot denounce RSS because BJP is RSS. Modi is RSS. So there's no way in which one could even imagine Narendra Modi that's not Hindu fascist. So in a way, he's there. This is why after 2014 election, even now, you have a uh, crucial role played by RSS directly in who gets appointed a minister, who doesn't get appointed a minister. In the past, they had to hide it a bit, right? To show, you know, liberals can be quite slippery, as you can imagine. Just to assure liberal urban Indian that okay, they don't really like khaki chaddis. You know, chaddi, okay, by chaddis, in case you didn't know, the idea of the khaki shorts. Now you've got Arnab Goswami, I don't know what chaddi he wears and what color chaddi he wears, but he might be wearing Gucci Prada, I don't know, but at least even they are more Sanghis than the Sanghis. So they have reinvented themselves in a manner in which they have become respectable. And that is the danger. The danger is it's no longer a fringe phenomenon of extremists, it is the mainstream phenomenon. So I have um, two questions here. One was you said that the Muslims also voted to BJP, which we discussed, you're saying a bit more. And the other one is actually, obviously the Indian cinema works quite actively in India, watched quite a lot, so Bollywood. And that tends to be always not nationalist. I mean, it seems to show the Muslims and, and, and the Hindus quite close together, lots of ways very close. Um, uh, how come that's not been affected? I mean, because uh, that obviously brings tries to bring down bring the communities together. Yep. Okay. Of in th thanks. In terms of Muslim voting, I mean, recent yesterday a report came out on breakdown of it, and majority of Muslim did not vote for BJP. Right? In most places, they did not. Of course, BJP said they will vote for it. In some areas, including Lucknow, the place, it seems that particularly Shia Muslims voted for. I mean, that's what it seems because we don't know exactly what happened, right? But they voted for that because they had their own sectarian tension with the Sunnis. That's what was used. In Gujarat, again, some of them vote for BJP and they have been voting for BJP. And the way I would explain that is when you're dealing with a very strong authoritarian leader in a democratic context, of course, electoral context, and you know you have no power with, the, with them electorally, the only way to survive and flourish economically is to give them money and get protection. It's like hafta, right? So you'd have the, I would say, the, you know, the Daud Ibrahim kind of, the, what was in Daud Ibrahim? What was that guy, right? Where, where is he now, Karachi or somewhere? Anyway, uh, Daud Ibrahim. So it's like hafta with mafia. So basically, Hindu nationals operate as mafia in that context where Muslims, if they vote, they will vote so that in return they get protection. It's largely to prevent them from being killed. Now in terms of, what was the second thing you said? It was Bollywood. Bollywood. Yeah, no. If you take example of Bollywood in 50s, 60s, 70s, largely communal harmony and everything was there. But since 1990s have started changing. You have got representation of Muslims as terrorists. Usually Kashmiri Muslims, but Kashmiri Muslims are terrorists. By now, of course, if you look at movies, not only Bollywood stars being openly with Modi and talking about Modi, not only Paresh Rawal or Kangana Ranawat, but some a few more, right? But someone like uh, Amir Khan saying that his wife does not feel safe, wife is Hindu, right? Does not feel safe for children in India would imply that he's, because there was a whole intolerance debate, the intolerance debate that in, the India has become intolerant, that's gone. Now even he would not express because of course there was a backlash against him. So if you take example of Bollywood uh, uh, Hindi movies now, it's already changing. Now of course there are many Muslims involved in the industry, therefore it's not easy to change. And why would, movies just create something that's based on hate. But you do have phenomenon which was not in 50s, 60s of almost explicit Islamophobia. So there's interesting work on how would Muslims look like in Bollywood films. They would always have skull caps. They'd always wear uh, a certain kind of scars and cover that. When Muslims are all of all kinds in India, right? But they have certain stereotypes. They'd be either so pious and so good that they can, get, they can do no wrong or they are terrorists. They will, they will not be a modern subject. You know, so a modern subject will only be Hindu. So Muslims will be either very pious or terrorist. Nowhere in between. So it's already changing. Yeah, sir. Um, I was wondering if you could say something more about the academic space. Um, because you mentioned about the appointment at JNU. And I'm just thinking uh, for Central and Eastern Europe, what is happening is that 
um, it's not the whole universities don't get targeted, but specific departments. So for example, you know, in Hungary, the gender department yeah. is moving to Vienna. Um, in Poland, um, gender departments uh, or sort of left-leaning departments are getting defunded. So could you say more about what's happening in India? Like, is it only JNU or is it widespread? And, and what is the resistance also? Is there resistance? Uh, thanks. In fact, uh, one of the first controversies that erupted after 2014 was around JNU, right? So it started with JNU. Of course, it was, and Kashmir becomes the easy, to, Babri Masjid, this is already gone. De facto, whether there will be a temple there or not, I, ca I mean, even I can't imagine any other option now. I mean, imagine if Supreme Court actually says, build, rebuild a mosque, what would happen, right? Supreme Court might be burnt down. That's the kind of mobilization that's taking place, right? So they can't use Babri Majid forever, but Kashmir is the next one, so they're doing it. So around JNU, controversy was around supposed slogans given by left students and Kashmir students that basically should uh, break up India. So Tukre Tukre Gang means gang that wa talks about uh, breakup of India. They use again JNU, but it was not only JNU, you also have Hyderabad Central University, another central university. Basic target is of public universities. In India, you have affirmative action. Affirmative action for uh, up to 50% seats are reserved for those from marginalized background. So poor Dalits and others can only get into education through that. So what BJP has done cleverly, of course they can't target them openly because they lose vote. By targeting public universities that are fee would be very little, 10 pounds for a year kind of thing, right? The, by targeting them, by calling them anti-national, anti-national, they're also reducing funding there. So there's that trend. So it's not only JNU, not only Hyderabad Central University, Hyderabad Central University had a Dalit student who had committed suicide. Uh, I'd met him five days before he committed suicide. Again, he, so you have targeting of different public universities, students. You have targeting for academics. <coughs> academics being targeted, not getting post, not being allowed to travel overseas for conference kind of stuff, right? Now, big universities like JNU, they're still resisting, the students and staff, because they're together. But small universities, small town universities are not resisting anymore because they have given up. They didn't have the social capital that JNU will have, right? So if JNU something happens, we'll go out in London and protest. We had over 100 academics protested. Something happens in Allahabad University or Patna University, something, people do not protest. In terms of targeting of particular point, yes, that's also happening. So gender studies, Dalit-related studies. Ambedkar, Ambedkar was the, the, the Dalit, well, he was an Indian leader who was also Dalit leader, who was quite radical, and anything connected to caste, that's being defunded, unfunded. Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Bombay, their funding is being cut. Private universities are increasing. Private universities would imply essentially upper caste, upper class Hindus. So they're targeting that deliberately because, of course, they do see universities as spaces that are liberal, which means left in that context, and the one that is anti-national. And the disturbing phenomenon I found was auto driver in Delhi. You'd say, oh, I'm going to GNU. You'd say, oh, that's anti-national. I mean, I said, but <laughs> you, so this is how popular imagination has a function. A popular imagination, they started shifting popular imagination already. But what, uh, in GNU, uh, uh, these universities, the increasing fund for sciences, you think that's a good thing? Yes. But they also assume that people who study sciences are going to be right-wing. And people who study human social science are left-wing. That's how they see it, and which is often the case. Engineering is increasing. Science is increasing funding there. And you ha now have, even in places like JNU, which is known for left-wing views, right-wing professors, mostly in sciences and other places, right, who will be talking of uh, minorities being threats and uh, tweeting and writing very public. So they're getting promotion, others are not. That's how it is happening. Uh, thank you so much. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about this uh, citizenship deprivation debate in Assam, and Amit Shah has been talking about spreading it to the rest of the country, and what does that mean for the future of Muslims? And just one observation on the Bollywood thing. Uh, last time we were in India, we saw this uh, movie Padmavat, and there were a lot of uh, protests at the time that this is anti-Rajput, anti-Hindu, anti... -Hindu, anti then when we saw it, it was the most Islamophobic and uh, patri patriarchal kind of film that I thought that, uh, but there was no real discussion of that in, in the media. There, so it was quite interesting to see. Yeah, no, thanks. The, I'll also, kind of one point I had to raise you know, about uh, academics in India, but also think of academic space here. In general, when Modi was, might have won, we, we thought he'd win an election, we didn't let, I'll come back to this, uh, election 2014, there was a letter done by almost 50 of us, 50 academics, Indian and connected to India in the UK, saying that how victory of Narendra Modi would be danger for democracy, right? Uh, not a single Muslim name. 
and i thought but why that's simply because if you look at indian academics here most of us even though we are left happen to be non muslims so something has happened where muslims have already been silenced in academic space even in left wing academic space that's one secondly of course after that there was a lot of backlash now you have got promotion of chairs and professors here who are saying that oh people like us are sell outs to britain because somehow we are brainwashed by britain and they are not they are born here i was born in india right but that's the kind of language they use against us uh, so but they know it what works is targeting university so for instance at lsc we had before before election we had students you know sort of left progressive students came together so as lsc events they were not getting permission but the right wing ones would get permission right now my you know see the i'm head of school so it's easy right but now because we are, and my colleagues are very critical so we manage but that space is also shrink and we know that battle over progressive ideas will come here also this is what i meant by diaspora now coming back to uh, you're right even padmavat and other place of course it's a complicated thing because there was a whole idea of rajput pride is being hurt and this and that and then they get attention through that that's part of it right and then if you see that movie what i didn't watch the movie <laughs> deliberately I, i'm not saying it was if you character they big protein would be very islamophobic that's the whole point i said muslims are either very pious and very nice who are victims and so innocent or they are villain kind of thing that's already happening in everyday life here and you had also okay uh, yeah de facto citizenship so in assam you know anti immigrantism is quite common you know you uganda example right i mean you know that that you know the examples here you know example everywhere in case of india i would say that three kinds of people who are most abused and most exploited the biharis the nepalis and the bangladeshis the biharis are not actually biharis biharis would be biharis and east up they're the labor class in most parts of india they do the toil they do the hard work including places like gujarat but then they accused of being ah, the dirty ones and the la lazy also somehow but though they're the working ones right now with nepalis also nepalis doesn't mean nepali nepali means anyone from northeast nepal anyone who looks like nepali again hard work is their sweat and blood that runs india but they'd be accused of things and third would be bangladeshis the bangladeshi is a term used for all bengali muslims or bengali speaking muslims some of them might be illegal migrant or whatever many of them are not they bengali speaking muslim so bangladeshi is used for all of them so in assam the border region for last 30 years they have been saying that the local population is decreasing and you have got bengali speaking muslims so the bangladeshi infiltrators who are taking those right so they have got national register uh, uh, register now where essentially it's muslims who have to prove that they are they have a, a document from 50 years ago 40 years ago kind of thing right now of course most of us would have our document but you have to think of when you are poor people right you hardly have house you're homeless where would you get your documentation from or you might have document but you have lost it right or you're divorced and a woman who has been divorced the husband has run away with someone else right and you have no document he ran away with your document what happens to you so now of course there are blatant cases of even indian soldiers who fought for india in kargil now being struck off the register now of course but it worked it worked electorally and what they planning to do they're shifting to bengal they saying that in bengal also because bengal has almost one third muslim population they saying all of them or many of them are bangladeshis and we need to have register so if you're good honest muslim citizens then you don't need to fear but it is like if you're good honest brown and black people you don't need to fear but we know that when right wing comes and attacks us they're not going to ask for your passport and say oh are you paying taxes or not how what kind of taxes you're paying that's how it operates so it's, it is a phenomenon which worked electorally for them and they're using that now in bengal which was resistant to bjp and the in a way the most disappointing result from progressive side is in bengal this time because bengal was very left then it became trinamool congress which is sort of centrist but is now being portrayed as muslim pro muslim and therefore of course what you have is the left voters shifting to right now sometimes a lot of i mean i know not all voters are islamophobic by the way they will not be they do believe that maybe modi is a powerful leader he'll bring something but the fact of the matter is they vote will be used to mobilize hatred and make respectable what was seen as non respectable 20 years ago and that's a danger we are facing so when i said de facto citizenship and de that's that citizenship but in reality as a muslims can keep voting but if political parties realize that it's expensive to have muslim vote they'll start ignoring them that's what would happen Can you hear me? 
Thank you very much for a very comprehensive uh, treatment of the subject. I have two questions, maybe three. Uh, <laughs> the first one, a brief one. Uh, the first one is, uh, do you think the Buddhist uh, nationalist movement has been heavily influenced by the Hindu nationalist movement in India? I think there have been, but I'm not an expert in this area. Do you want to answer that before I go? No, on no, carry on. I'm taking okay. a note. And uh, my, my, my second one is that uh, thinking, projecting into the future, um, if uh, the way you described uh, the way India is going, uh, becoming almost <coughs> like a fascist statement and with the label of democracy and all that, in the wrong run, do you think the European values will trump trade interests and so on and begin to pay attention to internal setup in India and ideologically, ideologically, ideologically where it is uh, progressing and ultimately it could, uh, could be considered as a potential interest to <coughs> European or other, other, other Canadian countries. Okay. Yeah, okay. Anything else? Oh, uh, no. Deal with that. No, no, I can answer all together. I'm just thinking to. Okay. But keep, uh, they can't hear you, so. You need to bring the mic near. Oh, sorry. Um, I can hear you, but they can't. Yeah, okay, I forgot the third question. Uh, I think they're tired, so it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank, yeah. thank you. Uh, again, in terms of Buddhist, in India, Buddhist population is very tiny. So the question is more about, let's say, Rohingya case, if you take a Burma. Yeah. There's no direct connection, because if you look at the anti-Rohingya state sentiments and the political movement in, uh, in Burma, uh, Myanmar, it has been going on for almost 50 years, right? So it's separate. But they all feed on each other. They all feed on each other because, and I don't know, let's say, even I give example of Pakistan, right? In Pakistan, where you have got anyone accused of blasphemy, you get lynched, you get killed, you get put into prison, you have got similar kind of majoritarian religious nationalism and Sri Lanka also we know, right? Majoritarian religious nationalism presenting itself as victim of minorities and then of course committing violence against minorities. That's, so what's, it's happening something in uh, the comment. But what happened of course with the Rohingyas, a lot of Rohingyas took refuge in India. But now what BJP has done is they have declared all of them to be infiltrated and then pushing them out. But they're being pushed out as again illegal Bangladeshi migrant, which is what also Burma says that they are illegal Bangladeshi, they are not actually Burmese, right? that's what is happening. Now in India, a majority of Buddhists, which is a very tiny population, are Dalits. And they are seen as enemies by RSS, by the way. Remember, Ambedkar, Dr. Ambedkar, before he died, he, con he, he said, I, will, I was born Hindu, but I'll not die a Hindu. So of course, you can imagine, given that he was that big figure, you had uh, Muslims, you had Christians, you had everyone trying to make him convert, and he ultimately, chose Buddhism on the grounds that it was more liberating, more egalitarian, and he believed that both Islam and Christianity had adopted caste system in South Asia, right? And they have. So this is why he, they went with Buddhism. So the Dalit Buddhists are radical. They are not voting with BJP, but they are very small in number. Now in terms of, uh, 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 again, European values versus trade, I mean, take a look, Trump, I mean, what, uh, if you have European value, I mean, what kind of European value are we talking of when we look at Trump, right? I mean. We okay. know it, right? Or Orban, right? So in a way, I would say what Modi is doing is Europeanizing India. Europeanizing India sense because fascism comes from here. Fa it, this is the original home of fascism. And therefore we have to be very careful of trade versus European value because Western value is of genocide, colonization, anti-minoritism, as much as it's about democracy and everything else. It's a struggle. The answer to the challenge in India, and I know I should end with something positive rather than negative, right? is that uh, the struggle for, I won't say solo of India, but the struggle for democracy in India is going on. The struggle is an indigenous struggle. Whether you Westerners support it or not is unimportant, right? Whether diaspora, and someone asked about diaspora and its role, diaspora has played a very da uh, dangerous role. Not all, of course, there would be people like it, but then we are never united. The problem with progressive, we can never agree with each other. The left has always fought amongst each other. They went a fight and right wing can come together. You'd have a hundred people coming together using temple and something to fund and people like us will say, oh gosh, you're not 99% left, you're 100%, I'm 99, you're 98, 97. We always endlessly argue, right? That's part of the problem. But 
Look, the way I would say is intellectually, politically, socially, and culturally, because Hindu nationalism is based on a particular European idea of nationalism, that struggle will go on because India is very diverse. I'm not saying that diversity implies it will not, it will uh, defeat fascism. It may not defeat fascism, right? But we can be sure that it's not going to be that easy for them to implement Hindu nation. So what implies is that like, say, as diaspora, we should work hard to remind the world not to, to buy into the idea of India as the world's largest democracy. Because fascism has always emerged in democracy, not in non-democracy. They always emerge in democracy. To, it's through democracy. But it's not democracy, electoral democracy, not real democracy. That's how I would say it. So for me, hope is you have to keep struggling. You have to keep fighting. You have to keep talking. We have to keep... Hope, but not only hope and, okay, fine, you can pray. I don't pray, I don't pray, but we also have to work to make it function. But remember that this is not unique to India. And we are facing that, right? We are at this point in time, beat Hungary, Philippines, Turkey, India, Pakistan, US, who knows here, Brexit party, what they'll do. But, you know, with all these problems, that this struggle is ongoing. Maybe that's why solidarity is important, to learn from each other. Thank you. Thank you. No, we've got to finish, unfortunately. I know a lot of people... Uh, what, if it's okay, yeah, then I'm come fine. and ask I you. I can endlessly go till tomorrow morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to give a lecture on tomorrow on how China is a Western state <laughs> around these lines. That China is Western, not anti-Western. Yeah, uh, so so if, if they can come and talk to you afterwards, yeah, sure, sure. privately, that's, if that's okay, if you can talk directly, that would be uh, ideal. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Salawat. <laughs>